2719. What a great story that is. You know, I have a theory that most things in a museum were stolen. I mean, if you look at the antiquities of Egypt, where are they? Well, they're in the London Museum. Uh, when you look at the artifacts of the indigenous tribal peoples, um, there are very few uh, native museums run by tribal people. It's becoming more and more prevalent, I'm happy to say. I'm also happy to say that our organization here, the St. Louis County Historical Society, has repatriated much of their indigenous artifacts to several very successful uh, tribal museums in our area. So a lot of repatriation has been done and I'm in favor of that. Uh, artifacts should be as close to home as possible. Again, as I mentioned earlier, we have a regional collection of railroad artifacts. They're here where they belong. And yes, we did steal. In fact, I'm proud of it. I stole the 2719, darn it. It took me a while, but I did it. I'm proud of it. But the Sioux line doesn't exist anymore, so I can't give it back to them. I didn't steal it from them anyway. I stole it from the city of Eau Claire. Uh, 2719 was built in 1923, right from the book, by the American Locomotive Works in Schenectady, New York. It's a Pacific, which means it's a 462. It was built for passenger service. Uh, it was the last steam engine to operate on the Sioux line. It carried many well-known trains, uh, including the Laker, which was a Sioux Line overnight train, all Pullman, all first class, uh, Pullman overnight train, uh, the Laker that went from downtown Duluth to uh, downtown Chicago overnight. And it pulled the Laker for many years. Um, it also pulled the Dakota, which was a train that went out of the Twin Cities to, let's see, oh yeah, the Dakotas. Um, what's unique about this engine um, is that it has 74-inch uh, drivers. Now, the bigger the driver in diameter, the faster the engine is made to go. So this engine was manufactured to go 90 miles an hour. That was what its drivers uh, could sustain. Um, and it's a, in fabulous condition because what the Sioux line did was at the end of the steam era, they decided, you know what? We're going to keep one of our steam engines. It'll be kind of our mascot and we'll run specialty trains with it. Um, we really like these Pacifics. Uh, so when they still had the parts and they still had the people, uh, they took this one particular engine, the 2719, and ran it through their shops and rebuilt it. Top to bottom, mint condition. And then they ran it for a few years and gone, eh, you know what? Yeah, this isn't working out. So they parked it and gave it to the city of Eau Claire, which put it in Carson Park. And there it sat for many years until the locomotive and tower preservation guys got together and said, you know what, this thing's in such good shape, we could run it. And so they pulled it out, uh, got it certified, and began running excursions, most of them on Wisconsin Central, uh, back when Mr. Burkhart was in charge of that railway. Um, well, Mr. Burkhart's railway was sold. The bottom line is that uh, mainline steam excursions uh, came to an end. And the engine sat unattended, derelict, and a attractive nuisance in the yard at um, uh, Altoona, Wisconsin. So Steve King, the rail fans, Kleshinsky came up with an idea to uh, save the engine and move it to Duluth, uh, which we did with the help of the Canadian National Railway and Union Pacific Railway, two great partners on this project. Oh, and BNSF, all three of the, all three class ones contributed to, to this move, uh, which was monumental. And we ran it for a couple of years until its boiler expired. Um, the way it worked was the Tower and Locomotive Preservation people had bought it from the city of Eau Claire for $1. What we found out was that the Locomotive and Tower Preservation folks had gone out of existence. Um, and we really, they ceased to exist. So we went to the city of Eau Claire and said, you have a clause in your contract with this non-existent organization. They bought the engine from you for a buck. You can buy it back from them for a buck anytime you want. So go ahead and do that. And then we'll buy it from the city for two bucks. And that's what we did. Now keep in mind, the engine uh, is in perfect condition. It could run today. It's just its boiler license has expired. It's in fabulous condition. 
So we now buy this engine for two bucks and it's in the museum, but there's a problem. In our contract with the city of Eau Claire, they have a clawback feature where they, in five years, in the first five years that it's up here, if somebody's got a better idea for it that involves the city of Eau Claire, they can buy it back for four bucks. A couple of months before that clawback feature was to expire, a particular city councilor out of Eau Claire got the idea, let's buy the engine back and got a resolution passed. I went down to several, several city council meetings and said, you don't want this back. You're not a museum. Cities all across America are trying to get rid of their steam locomotives, not bring them home. It belongs, you know, as Indiana Jones said, on the heaving deck, in the middle of a storm, in the Catalina, as it was going down, and he grabbed the cross of Coronado, and he yanked it from around the hands of this other guy, and he said, this belongs in a museum. And that's exactly what I said to the Eau Claire City Council, to no avail whatsoever. They bought the engine back for four bucks. I immediately informed them, oh, I said, how are you going to move it? It took the Union Pacific, the Canadian National, Burlington Northern Santa Fe, and by the way, the very top people in those organizations to approve it, to move it here. You don't know any of those people. Two of them are already retired because one of them said, I'm going out the door. I'll do this for you uh, because no one's ever going to, I'm I'm retiring. Uh, Mr. Greenland said to me, he goes, yeah, I'll approve this. Uh, but the only reason I'm doing it is I'm going to retire in two months. And what are they going to do to me? I said, so you don't have that. And the city councilor held up a piece of paper that said, I've got a quote here to move this engine from by by roadway, by putting it, you know, house movers will move it down for $34,000. And I stood up out of order. And I said, if that's true, sign it. Turns out it was more like $350,000, but that's a small technicality. And so this city councilor was on the last year and a half of their term and already announced they weren't going to run for re-election. So we all just sat around and waited. I think the storage bill to the city of Eau Claire it was about forty-eight or $49,000 at the time it was all over. I said, either pay us the money, get your engine off the property, or give it to us for eight bucks. We'll double your money. And they begrudgingly sold it to us for eight bucks. And I stole it. I'm pretty proud of that. We're running a steam engine right now. It's a consolidated 332. It's a Duluth Masabi and Iron Range. Uh, when that 15-year boiler expires, about uh, with five years left on it, we'll start redoing the boiler on the 2719, and then we'll put that in service right afterwards. And uh, hopefully we can leapfrog those two engines into perpetuity. Locomotive tower preservation people ran some very successful excursions uh, when they had the, had the train. Um, and one of their most successful, I um, can't remember where they ran to. I think it was Ladysmith. I'm pretty sure that was one of their big runs over to Ladysmith on the uh, what was Wisconsin Central. And so they had, they had, uh, I don't know if it was a, I think it was a Saturday, Sunday. Anyway, um, they uh, ran the first trip brought the engine back and parked it. And in the middle of the night, rolled down, uh, picked a switch at Altoona and ended up on the main line. And that's a pretty busy main line. Uh, luckily it was a local that came through that night and was going slow, saw the engine, had fouled the main and stopped in time. They were able to get it back and park it, ran the next day's excursion. And this time it slipped out again picked the switch, followed the main, but it was a, uh, uh, it wasn't a local this time. It was a, uh, a fast freight and it smashed into the side of it. Luckily, no one was hurt. Uh, the crew on the train uh, was not hurt, uh, but the side of the engine was damaged. Um, 
insurance paid for the rebuild. So yes, one side uh, was was completely rebuilt on the on the on the on the drive gear. But it works fine. They did a great job. The tower and locomotive preservation people do get great credit for saving the engine from the park, for being very good stewards of it as long as they could, and um, and then working with the museum uh, to see that it was preserved in a much better place. It's completely covered. It's on display. You can see it. It's in our steam engine gallery. Uh, it's on a protect under a protective roof of a parking ramp above it. Uh, it's away from the elements. It gets no snow, no rain, um, and it's uh, in a perfect place uh, waiting for it to run again, and it will.
what's known as a 15 year FRA uh, full mandated boiler review. Uh, what you do is you take off all the appliances, the air pumps, um, you take off uh, everything. You take out the throttle and you take out all the existing boiler tubes and superheater tubes. And then you climb inside that boiler and um, you uh, do metal testing on the boiler. And then you do every square inch on a grid pattern. You measure the thickness of the boiler. And then you submit that along with the original specifications for the boiler metallurgically and also on that thickness. And you submit that to the FRA with a rebuild plan. If they approve that, then you put in all new boiler tubes and superheater tubes, and then put all the utensils back on the utilities and everything. And then you do a hydro test, you do a fire up, you do that all within the uh, inspection of the FRA. And um, then they give you another 15 years on that boiler with an annual inspection that's uh, very basic. So that's what's needed. Um, we just got to do that to the 332 is about three quarters of a million dollars and the engine we're running right now. Um, but that one had to be, everything had to be done. The asbestos had to be taken off, a new boiler jacket put on, uh, air pumps rebuilt. Uh, it needed a lot of work, uh, a wheel uh, reset. A lot of work went into that one. For this one, all we'll need to do is, the only thing that's gonna cost is going to be buying the tubes and having those installed by a professional boiler maker. Um, I, a couple of years ago, I, when we were looking at, should we do the 332 or the 2719? Um, I looked at the cost of the 2719 and at that time it was 70, $80,000 for those boiler tubes and for have a, a licensed boiler maker, uh, cinch them in. Um, but we didn't have any donors for that. We had a huge donor for the 332, we didn't come up with a quarter million or three quarters of a million dollars to do it. Uh, others did on our behalf. So with the donor base there that was very interested in that particular engine, um, we went with that particular engine. Um, there just wasn't the donor base for the suit line um, at, at, at that time. Now, will there be in the future? I have no fear that some future executive director, because I'll be gone by the time this happens, um, but some future executive director will have no problem raising the funds to do probably what by that time would be around $100,000 uh, to get that engine running again. And that would include a paint job too, because I mean, she looks good right now, but uh, she'd look a lot better with a better paint job. Um, my favorite story is Frank Christofferson, who unfortunately is no longer with us. Uh, Frank was a... Uh, Frank started working for the Great Northern Railway in high school, cleaning out the... Uh, the roundhouse, sweeping the roundhouse after uh, after school. He went off to World War II, um, learned railroading from the Army in the Army Rail Corps, came back and started driving steam engines for the Great Northern, um, became uh, a diesel engineer, uh, worked, I think he had like a almost a 40-year career with the Great Northern, not one injury day ever, became a uh, shop steward for the BLE, uh, was a state legislator, uh, owned several small town newspapers in the area, and was the quintessential gentleman. Um, and man, could he run that engine. When he ran that engine, we used less water and less coal than anybody else because he knew how to run those engines. And he always said it was the, one of the best engines he'd ever run. And his expression was, it's a shame we can only go 30 miles an hour because this one wants to run. Frank, when he heard that we were getting the engine uh, through the you know grapevine, uh, he came into my office one day, sat down straight across my desk as a volunteer. And he goes, you know, I understand we're thinking about getting a working steam engine. I said, well, we're working on it, talking about it. I don't know if it's going to happen or not. He says, you know, I ran steam for the Great Northern. I said, yeah, Frank, I know. He goes, when we were running the number 14, which was an earlier steam engine, still in the collection of the museum, but was our operating steam engine. 
He said, when, when we ran the 14 and it was in the movie Iron Will, he said, you know, I was the engineer on that one. I said, yeah, I know, Frank. He leans across my desk. He goes, one more time. And I'm happy to say Frank had many, many one more times in the 2719. He could run that engine. 